Hey, good afternoon. Welcome back to another episode of Nintendo Walkthrough and Reviews. Today we'll be looking at Paramount's The Untouchables. The Untouchables game was released in January of 1991, developed by Special Effects Software and produced by Ocean. No, not that one. No. There you go. Ocean Software was a major contributor to Nintendo's library and produced games from many popular movies, such as Lethal Weapon, Jurassic Park, The Addams Family. Unfortunately, the movies we loved as a kid became mediocre to average games on the NES, thanks to Ocean. In terms of cost, The Untouchables goes for about $16 today in 2020. So, without further ado, Paramount Picture presents The Untouchables. Let's get after it. The Untouchables film was a crime drama released on June 3, 1987. The film focused on the gangster syndicate of Chicago who were bootlegging and distributing illegal booze throughout the city during the height of Prohibition in 1930. The title, Untouchables, was in reference to the supposedly straight-laced, uncorruptible law enforcement agents led by Elliot Ness in pursuit of bringing back peace and taking down the infamous Al Capone. You fellas are untouchable, is that the thing? No one can get to you? Yeah. You took Capone. Hey, everyone can be got. And I'll see you in hell. The movie was an adaptation of Elliot Ness's autobiography of the same name, which helped cement his folklore status after his real-life death in 1957. Elliot Ness was initially portrayed as a squeaky clean go-getter, and no one does that better in 1987 than Kevin Costner. It's against the law, gentlemen, and as we are going to enforce the law, we must do first by example. Kevin Costner does a passable performance alongside an incredible cast, including Charles Martin Smith, Andy Garcia, Robert De Niro, and the great Sir Sean Connery, who snagged an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. Connery's performance is head and shoulders above that of Costner, and he owns every scene he's in. When you get the phone, here's how you get him. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the shit back. Old Bobby De Niro is no slouch either in his depiction of the short-tempered Al Capone, who plays himself like a wolf in sheep's clothing. You talk to me like that in front of my son, fuck you and your family. It's unfortunate that Al Capone's screen time is so condensed in favor of showing the story of Elliot Ness. I understand, see boy Elliot Ness. I want him dead. I want his family dead. I want his house burnt to the ground. I want to go to the middle of the night. I want to piss on his eggs. The movie was directed by Brian De Palma, the same man who made Carrie and Scarface. So you know there's going to be some good old fashioned violence. <laughs> The film grossed $106 million on a $25 million budget. Pretty easy to do when your only competition at the box office that weekend is Harry and the Hendersons. That said, the movie still holds up well over time when compared to dramas of the same subject matter. The on-scene locations and set designs were loyal to the era, with remarkable authenticity placed into every inch of the screen. From the buildings, the streets, the cars, the costumes, everything was covered, even down to the lucky strikes. The musical score is simply superb, encapsulating characters' emotions in every scene. The music drives the plot, fully immersing the audience into the highs and lows of the film. This is from the same composer that created the iconic music from the good, the bad, and the ugly. The dialogue is sharp and indicative of the timepiece. The chemistry between the Untouchable crew seems organic and spontaneous as if they had been already friends going into filmmaking. To protect the property and see the real yeah. Yeah. <laughs> With so many things going for it, it's a wonder why it wasn't even nominated for Best Picture that year. What are you prepared to do? My guess is that if the leading actor had a little more charisma, it would have pushed this into Best Movie Contention. Costner's performance felt too flat and passive. There's an uptick of emotions at the end of the flick when he transforms more into a vigilante for justice but it seems too little too late. A more chiseled job performance from someone like a Kurt Russell type would have been a more suitable choice. The climax of the film has Al Capone sentenced to prison for nothing other than tax evasion, which is a nice book into the movie and follows the real life events pretty closely. What are you saying? What are you saying? I said never stop fighting till the fight is done. Publishers at Ocean Software decided to strike when the iron was hot and release a video game version of the film three and a half years after its initial release. Not only that, Paramount only granted them licensing to use the cover for one year. 
This is why you see an update to the label shown in blue. Nintendo did the same thing for Mike Tyson when they had his image for three years, then had to update it in 1990. Most people think that Mike got dropped due to the scandal, when in fact it was just poor timing with the licensing deal. But I digress. Nintendo strived to have age-appropriate content on its video game library. And when I think of family-friendly movie adaptations for kids, The Untouchables seemed like a perfect choice. The change, you filthy animal. Seeing this, it's a wonder why Nintendo didn't capitalize on Goodfellas becoming a Nintendo game. Now that would be funny. Funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you, I make you laugh. All right, let's pop this bad boy in. On the game's title screen, we see Kevin Costner and three silhouettes. What? Did Sean Connery not want to be involved? Thank you, no. Jeez, nails on a chalkboard. That jarring alarm sound is the start of every level. You have seven different levels depicted as scenes. In scene one, we're going through the streets, blasting dudes with a shotgun. Where are you going with that shotgun? You scroll the reticle around using D-pad input, and there's no light gun for this game. What the hell, Ocean? When you riddle enough gangsters, it rolls over to the next street. This time, there'll be more enemies with a shorter time limit. Your score is based on proximity to the enemy. For each of the alleyways, you get 50 points for shooting the guy in the first window, 100 points for the middle, 120 for the back, and 150 points for the top window. But who cares, because the rules are made up and the points don't matter. They don't matter because you'll be hugging the wall every two seconds, reloading your pump shotgun that holds two shells. And they're using liberties with the term shotgun, because you need pinpoint accuracy with this damn thing. It's like they only put one BB into that buckshot. There's no spray and pray here. So Elliot, you're gonna miss like all your shots. Do you understand? Yes, I do. Missed him. Just a bit outside. Miss. 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 Miss, 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 Jesus! And reload. You're a horrible shot! Andy Garcia, aka George Stone, aka Giuseppe Patri, would have been ideal for this level. The bad part about missing is it sucks up so much time, and you got 25 seconds to get through this level. If not, it's game over. Whether you win or lose, the outcome is shown on the Chicago Daily Newspaper, which I think is a very nice touch to the movie throwback, where they'd use newspaper headlines as a plot-pushing device for the audience. It was definitely an excess, but the movie loved using this trope. We get it. We know how to read. Just tell us the story. Okay, back to the shootout. You always seem to be a fraction of a second behind these guys as you chase them around the whole damn screen with your cursor before they pop back into the window. The gangsters will only come on screen for about a second, so unless your crosshairs are already trained to them, you're going to miss your opportunity. I look at a good example of a shooter like Operation Wolf, and they'll let you actually change the gun sight speed so you can blast dudes throughout the whole map and track in on them within a fraction of a second. There's even a light gun feature. Because the developers skimped out on the light gun for this game, I found the only thing that works is keeping the cursor centered on the screen and just adjusting it left and right very slightly. This significantly reduces the range you have to cover, so it's a lot quicker to kill these enemies. Don't worry about taking shots along the way, you can just stick your neck out there and take the damage. And just ignore chasing the guys in the second story, it wastes too much time. And like I said, the points don't matter. When you get enough kills, it goes to the newspaper saying you beat the level, congratulations. After you beat it, for whatever reason it takes you back to the title screen before proceeding to the next level. I like how the start of each level gives you a quick summary of what to do. I don't need to read the manual, I just gotta get the guy in the gray hat. And when they say get, what they really mean is murder, cause you're straight up capping fools. No time for a search warrant or any due process, cause apparently Elliot Ness takes a law into his own hands when he starts gunning down dudes for selling booze. This is vastly different than how the plot played out in the movie when they conducted their whiskey raid Let's do some good. with an army of Chicago's finest and Elliot Ness in the lead. But thanks to an inside tip from a corrupt cop on Al Capone's oh, payroll, right Elliot Ness came up empty. Federal officer, You're under arrest for violations of the False Dead Act! Spoiler alert, there's nothing in those Fragile whiskey boxes other than some Japanese umbrellas. Damn, that's cold-blooded. 
But there's no boring umbrellas in the video game rendition. As you track down the gray-hatted suspects, the guys in the yellow hat are the ones that shoot you constantly, and their bullets are microscopic on the screen. But at least running into enemies doesn't inflict any damage. Killing enemies will occasionally drop one or three items. Picking up the R grants you temporary unlimited ammo, so let those bullets fly. You can also crouch by pressing down to duck under the barrage of gunfire, which can be a lifesaver. Enemies will also drop ammo, shown as the letter A. Picking it up will max out your rifle clip with 10 bullets. But if you run out of ammo, there's no melee alternative, so you have to jump around like a jackass avoiding gunfire until you can find more. The level is quite small, but if you wait long enough, ammo will reappear in one of the four corners. Repeatedly tapping the B button lets you hop around like the Easter Bunny. It's the fastest way to traverse the level, even though you look like a complete moron doing it. Climbing up to the second floor is a nightmare as you try to navigate which crates you can actually jump on and which are just part of the background. The crates are indistinguishable, and each time you attempt to jump up it, the screen will snap back and forth between the first and second level. It's piss poor game design that makes me nauseous, not to mention the fact that you're wasting valuable time, coupled with the fact that the guys in the yellow hat are on me like African mosquitoes, which I end up dying if I don't take credence to their nuisance presence. Say that five times. If you find yourself low on health, you can do some farming and let them come to you. With enough tries, they'll eventually drop the last of the three items, which is an energy refill labeled as a letter E. No, not that E. Come on, get out of here. When you finally manage to kill a guy in a gray hat, they'll drop a portion of evidence. This evidence kind of reminds me of the game Who Framed Roger Rabbit, where you're running around aimlessly looking for clues. Yeah, fuck that game. And again, this is only a piece of the evidence. A fraction! You're talking fractions? In Nintendo games? Come on. The game could have simply stated, find five articles of evidence, but no, they want you to find one piece of evidence broken up into five parts, like it's some kind of elusive treasure map to dry land. Come on, Kevin Costner. As a treasury agent, apparently the pursuit of evidence collection justifies all-out street homicide. I mean, the game makes no bones about it. Elliot Ness came for two things, shoot guys in the back and drink some beer. But thanks to Prohibition, he's all out of beer. Racking up a body count like Rambo, Elliot Ness now heads up his own team in level 3. Your task for this is to shoot bottles and collect evidence as part of the border raid scene. In the movie, Elliot Ness and his untouchables are working with the Canadian Royal Mountie to intercept Capone's shipment of booze as it enters the northern US border. It's a memorable scene with music that matches perfectly and brings some levity to the film and their choice to ride in on horseback adds another layer of iconic charm. Unfortunately, there's no valiant horseback entrance in the video game as it simply drops you in the bridge amidst the gunfire. Your character's in the prone position on the bridge. No horses, no Canadians, no cover. Just you looking like an idiot rolling on the floor in the middle of the street. I mean, there's one brief moment in the movie where Elliot Ness drops to the ground during the gunfire, and I suppose the developer decided to dedicate an entire level based upon it. And so here we are. The aiming mechanic is rather gawky, there's no established reticle, as your gunfire only appears after holding down either the A or B button to spray your machine gun, and the sound effect sounds more like somebody lightly tapping on glass than it does machine gun fire. Without a dedicated crosshair, you're forced to walk in all of your shots into the enemies. Fortunately, they cut you a brick and give you unlimited ammo. Are you having fun yet? Because the maneuverability in this level is a travesty. You can point straight up or down on the vertical axis, no problem. But as soon as you stray left or right, your character first has to complete his lumbering barrel roll across the floor. I can't emphasize how pointless this rolling feature is. Your lethargic acrobats make you look like some kind of slapstick idiot. If they would give you a damn light gun like a duck hunt, this level would be over in less than a minute. But since I can't slew my weapon, I'm forced to crisscross this bridge back and forth, scoping out bottles to shoot. Yes, that's your sole purpose is to shoot these gray bottles of booze. It kind of reminds me of the movie The Jerk, when the guy was shooting up all those cans. Die, gas pupper! He hates these cans! Stay away from the cans!
As shooting bottles somehow counts towards your evidence collection, each one you destroy adds 4% to your total evidence. Why are they so stuck on using percentages? Do you think five-year-old me knows what 4% of anything is? Why not instead just have a countdown on your status bar beginning with 25 bottles? It's much easier to comprehend. But there's no comprehending why destroying bottles leads to gathering evidence in the first place. Wouldn't you want to preserve the evidence in its pure form? The only time you should destroy the container is to get a sip of what's inside. Oh yeah, and as you're rolling around like you're trying to put out some non-existent fire like Ricky Bobby, you're still taking hit damage. Your dodging ain't doing shit. Fortunately, you have three other characters to choose from by pressing the select button. Each of them has an independent health bar, so it's important to be proactive and cycle through the characters before they perish. It's a similar setup to that of swapping the characters in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But unlike TMNT, your character's life will regenerate when not actively being used. So as long as you're routinely swapping out characters, they'll eventually all come back up to full health. So the only true dilemma in this level is time. You start out with only 4 minutes on your timer, and it could take a good 30 seconds to roll the entire length of the screen. And while I do all this, I gotta ask myself, am I even having any fun? The experience is dreadfully boring. I'm on a monotonous easter egg hunt with repetitive music. I would have much preferred a shooter on rails where the screen moves, you get much more variety. Operation Wolf and the Punisher for the NES are perfect examples of 8-bit shooters done right. In the game The Punisher, there's much more involvement with the landscape as well as a variety of weapons and your movement is much more fluid. They also added another layer of complexity by allowing The Punisher to scroll left and right on the screen as he's shooting to avoid gunfire. It's shooter execution done right, a luxury we don't have with the Untouchables game. Okay, got 10 seconds left, only 2 more bottles, I mean 8% evidence, come on. There's one. Just get it, shoot it! Yes, okay, last one, come on, come on, come on. Wait, what happened? Oh, thank god, I got it. One second left. I did not want to replay that level. And it couldn't get much worse than that anyway. Oh no, the alley again? No! Come on. Alright then, faster, funnier. It's the same premise as the first level, this time with more frequent enemies who deal a staggering amount of damage. I'm 8 seconds into the level and I'm nearly halfway dead. Any remaining time will pass on to the next level. When you inevitably run out of life, the game will auto-cycle to the next character. But you won't see any fancy animation, it will simply keep the same damn sprite. Pure laziness, just like the previous level. I appreciate it that they increase the difficulty, but this is nuts. I know it doesn't look it, but I'm getting smoked right now. The only way to possibly beat this level is to guess which of the 8 windows are going to pop out next, but it's always random, I can never figure out a pattern. It's nearly impossible as you've got 2 bullets and like 5 dudes to kill. The fuck were you gonna do? Laugh the last 3 to death, funny man! I could not get through this damn level without being riddled with bullets. I was getting blasted over and over and over again. I felt like Paul Wheeler in the opening of Robocop. Alright, screw this. I'm just gonna use the level skip. It's the only cheat I could find in the game. And to pull it off, you go to the high score screen and you put the initials X, V, Q. Then, once on the stage screen, you'll press up and AB at the same time. It will pull you back to the title screen, but now you've jumped up a level. And you can keep using this technique if you want to power through the entire game. But for now, we're going to stop on stage 5 where I'm supposed to guide and defend the baby carriage. You start the level on the top of these stairs getting shot at. Wait, what? How'd I die? Alright, let's try the skin. You're getting shot at from the bottom, right? Oh, jeez, it's the baby that's dying. Alright, let's back up for a second. For some context, in the movie, Elliot Ness leads a stakeout looking for the bookkeeper at Chicago's Union Station. As he helps a struggling mother lift her baby carriage, his cover is blown and chaos erupts with a baby caught in the middle. It's now up to you to save the baby before it becomes a human slinky down the stairs. Okay, right from the get-go, you have to push the baby carriage far left to avoid hitting the handrail. Never mind the gunfire, just make sure the baby doesn't bump into things at a leisurely speed. Your objective in this is to protect the baby all the way through the train station. So don't get too wrapped up shooting gangsters, otherwise you'll forget your babysitting duties. Because if it runs into anything, it becomes a dead baby. And that's no joke. Sometimes you'll see the wall to avoid, but you still can't get over to the side of the baby to push him back on course. So your fate is sealed and you have to start over. Elliot Ness's speed is slightly faster than the baby. 
but not by much. The best thing to do is stay out in front and give that baby a wide berth. The level will open up and give you various paths to choose from, but you gotta make a snappy decision, otherwise it's too late and you get trapped. There are arrows on the ground which do point in the right direction, but by the time you see them, you're already committed to your decision, which makes it that much more important to get out in front. And even when things are going great, sometimes the baby will just fall over and die. What the fuck? If the carriage hits a roadblock or dead end, it's game over. So whatever you do, don't put baby in the corner. Just like an argument with your wife, the game will trick you into a no-win situation. Look here, I'm in front of the baby so he doesn't hit the wall, but now I'm stuck. I can't push the baby back, and I can't kill myself, or press start and quit. So my only choice is to run out the clock and wait another four minutes to retry this damn level. You're killing me, Smalls. And you have to give credence to these railings. Even if one pixel touches that carriage, she's going down. And look out for pedestrians, too. If you obstruct the baby at all going down those stairs, it dies. But wasn't the whole purpose in the movie to stop the baby from falling down the stairs? I don't get it. I guess the baby's like a shark and that it has to keep moving. For how fragile the baby looks, he's good at one thing, sucking up bullets. The baby's health bar is on the bottom of the screen next to yours, and he could take like 30 shots before going down. So don't be afraid to use him as a human shield, cause that bundle of joy can take a beating. And the way he tags along with you, it's kinda like he's your partner, like you're a buddy cop duo. Yeah, have you seen Cop and a Half? Well this is Cop and a Baby. Watch as Elliot Ness and Baby clean up the mean streets of Chicago, all before nap time. Starring Elliot Ness, aka The Untouchable, and Baby Huey, aka The Bullet Sponge. One brings the firepower, the other brings the pacifier in this gritty new drama. These guys don't take shit from no one. Innocent civilian blocking their path? No problem, just cap his ass and move on. Nothing's gonna stop this baby from getting its tummy time. There, with enough perseverance you get to the end. It looks like a dead end, but you don't die, you just beat the level. It's a good thing too, because that baby was only two days from retirement. Let's jump right into stage six where I'm supposed to kill the man in the brown hat holding the hostage. This quick level is in reference to the hostage situation directly following the train station shootout and plays more like a mini game or a bonus level. The game offers two modes before you start. I have never seen a practice mode in the middle of normal gameplay. Let's try the practice mode. It plays in first person fashion where you're given one chance to land a precise headshot. If you miss, he'll end up executing the hostage. Uh, pop quiz, hotshot! Terrace holding a police hostage, he's got enough dynamite strapped to his chest to blow a building in half. Now what do you do? That could have gone better. Fortunately, there's unlimited tries in practice mode. Use the D-pad to move your hand slowly around the screen. You can only put the gun up to his head level for one exact moment, so it's tougher than it looks. Damn it. But while in practice mode, if you do finally end up capping him, it still takes you back to the mode select screen. This time we'll pick the play mode. The real gamble is that if you lose in play mode, it sends you back to the beginning of the previous level, which is the damn baby carriage level. No fucking way. Let's skip forward and try the skin. All I gotta do is focus. You got him? Yeah, I got him. <laughs> One! Take him. <laughs> Two. Whew, save the vital witness and on to the last stage. The rooftop shootout against Nettie, Al Capone's right-hand man. When discovering who murdered Sean Connery's character, Elliot Ness is in hot pursuit on the courtroom rooftop. And surprise, surprise, yet another third-person static shooter. This time, it's just one enemy who weaves in and out of various openings as you're armed with that damn slow-moving pink crosshair. In the movie, Elliot Ness is first bound to arrest the killer rather than seeking vengeance. But where's the fun in that? Time to shoot first and ask questions later. You can take cover behind buildings by pressing left or right on the D-pad. But the enemy's got a quick draw and will always get that first shot when you step out to engage. Well shit, I was gunned down by the hitman. Time for some payback. I find the best strategy is to wait until he shoots first, then tag him when he's on the run. Once you do hit him, he'll jump back, looking like Michael Jackson. Ugh, so lame. You start with your trusty six shooter and can reload the revolver by moving the cursor to the far side of the screen, then tapping the A button to load it one bullet at a time. I initially didn't know about the reload option and was trying to tag him a perfect six for six to push him back off the ledge. 
You can only reload when hiding behind buildings, so if you run out of ammo at the last pillar, you end up just like Sarah Connor. Every time the villain changes size, your character will automatically shift to the opposite side, making you vulnerable to gunfire. Because your character's actions are dependent on the enemy's movements, either left or right, it's important to plan ahead to ensure you have cover every step of the way. I found sometimes I let him pass right in front of me without shooting, just so I can rotate to the opposite side. This is definitely the most difficult portion of the game, as it should be, you're on the last level. With no set pattern and a powerful boss weapon, it will take a portion of my cunning. No wait. All my cunning. Donde esta la biblioteca, baby? And just like that, Elliot Ness is victorious. You've won. Capone is sentenced to 10 years. Congrats to you. Capone is now behind bars, looking like an underground troll person, destined to die a slow death as syphilis gradually deteriorates his brain, turning his mental state to that of a small child. The end. Hey everybody, and that concludes the walkthrough and review of The Untouchables. Overall, I gotta say the experience is pretty average. It's a forgettable game. Overall, I would give it two out of five stars. The graphics are average for 1991. There's better games out there, and there's also worse, so I can't knock it for that. It was a great initiative to have key scenes in the movie play out in the video game, which I do appreciate. However, the levels are very short, and they go right on to the next one. There's no bosses, with the exception of maybe the last level, it just abruptly ends every level. So on the surface, everything looks fine, but there's no depth to it. I wouldn't come back to this game. I beat it just for this review to get it over with, essentially. It's not fun to play. It's not a broken game, per se. It's just not an enjoyable one. So in closing, go see the movie and avoid this game. I hope you see you again next time. Thanks. Now go home and get your fucking shine box. Motherfucking mutt! You, you fucking piece of shit! Yeah, 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 come on.